Isn't the Lord's presence so sweet? Holy Spirit is so gracious to us. And I'm so glad to be able to worship with you and just rest in that truth. And, and as we begin in, in this uh, moment of preaching, let me just first by introducing myself. My name is Pastor Todd. I'm uh, the pastor here. And uh, we have, thank you. I, I got the golf clap there. I like that. Well, if you're watching online, a uh, special welcome to you. If this is your first time here with us, uh, we are so glad that you have joined us. I just call your attention to the Connect card. Uh, please fill this out. We'd love to connect with you further. Uh, give that to Miss Dawn or Miss Dottie at the welcome desk. We have a small gift. Um, all of that. But we also have a, a wonderful moment today, uh, which is we call, what we call Community Dish. So if you have not attended a community dish and you've been with us, uh, joined us in the last three months or so, we would love to have a meal with you, uh, an opportunity. We will have plenty of food, so even if you didn't sign up, we will figure it out, uh, and we would just love for you to join us. But this is, once again, just an opportunity for us uh, to just get to know each other more and to be the family of God. So we would love for you to join us. But as you may be aware, we are in the midst of a transition here as a church as I take over as the lead pastor and we celebrated and had wonderful moments. And, and you guys may kind of see this as I do, but the first things you do matter, right? The things that you first focus on, the things that you first do. And so I just want to provide a little bit of an explanation on why this series of vision would be the first series that I would want us to lead us through. And really it's coming from a, a personal conviction in my own life and in my own uh, ministry and just what does it mean for us as followers of Christ to sharpen our vision of what does it mean for our hearts to be broken for those who do not know Christ, that do not experience the joy of His salvation, that do not walk with hope, but walk in condemnation, that do not walk in love and joy and peace, but in the brokenness and hardship of our daily lives. But I might be the only horrible person in the room, but I find it strangely easy to get caught up in life. Anybody else a horrible person with me? <laughs> And it's just how life goes, right? Guess what? The bills come every month. The time you got to punch in for work comes. And just life happens. And it's just so crazily easy for us to coexist without having a burning empathy and compassion for those without a salvation in Christ. And so this has been a growing conviction for us as a church, and, and this is just who we are, so this is not a new conversation at all. But it really, it started in my heart, even in last March. Uh, many of our staff attended a conference called Exponential in Orlando, which, praise the Lord, we live in Florida, where everybody wants to come to us. Right? Amen? Like vacation time, conference time, they all come to us. It's great. But the topic of this uh, conference was entitled Lost Cause. And it was a conversation of what evangelism looks like in America in this modern era. And more times than not, we view it as a lost cause. Like, yes, we're, we'll, we will be faithful. Yes, we'll try to be Jesus' representative. But if we're honest, it feels like a lost cause. Anybody else get to that dark spot before? I know I have. But for us, even as we begin this perspective, this shift that happens, it's really, this conversation is really a change of vision. The change in the way that we see the world around us. And being aware of how easy it is for us to be distracted, and yet the calling and urgency that we all have to love people well in this life and into the next. Amen? And so for us, that's where we began last week. We started this series of vision of what does it look like for us to have Jesus' eyes. For us, that, that awareness that God can actually change our situation. God can actually change Hernando County to such a degree that it is a place that's not known for whatever fill-in-the-blank thing you want to go on a rant on. Traffic, I'll go there. Whatever that thing may be, but to see Hernando County as a place of love, 
a place of compassion, a place where salvation is easily found where the church's unity is to such a degree that they see Jesus. Is that a community you want to live in? And it is possible to be seen in this life. Because so often it can feel like a lost cause. And we talked last week about what does it mean for us to change our eyes and actually have hope to see a change where we walk in the authority that Christ gives us as followers of Christ, as bringers of the kingdom wherever we go, where we are no longer making the obstacles of our lives so big and our God so small. So often that's what we do in our life, and yet we have an opportunity when we change our vision, we see the obstacles of our life in relationship to the authority of our God we actually have hope. We can anticipate. So it's not only a if, but a when we see the vision of Christ in this community, in this world. And so we talked through that reality of what does it mean. But for us, the next step we want to take is not only have a vision of hope, but to realize the place in which we have the opportunity to make the most impact. If you uh, were with us last week, we talked about what does it mean to be an influencer. Uh, and really, in the world's mindset, somebody that is the place where the most influence happens is the people on the stages. The people on whatever social media platform exists out there that have millions of followers. They have loud voices. They have the most influence, right? The people who write books, do podcasts, all of the above. And I'm not going to argue, yes, they have a great influence and and. Hopefully they have an influence for God. But I would argue, though they have, may have a broad influence, they do not have a deep influence. And it is that deep influence that we want to talk about as what does it mean for us to have that deep influence as followers of Christ. Because as we think through what does it look like for the world to change, it's easy for us to think that world expectation, but we can also get caught into a church organization mindset of what does this mean for this to happen is programs of the church. And, and this may be like new pastors shooting them in the foot. I am not speaking negatively about any of these ministries. They are all in obedience to what God has called us. But the solution to see a deep impact in our community is not found only in the partnerships that we have. If you're a part of our 24 hours of prayer, we went through the majority of our partnerships. Our church is connected with so many different Christian churches, Christian communities, Christian organizations doing great things in our community. We have a great unity of what does it mean for us as followers of Christ to be the church, where churches come together and to see a deep change in our community, to see that unity. Our church has adopted a middle school and partnered with other schools and done all kinds of different things in the community. We have a jail ministry. We have a food pantry. We have a dollar club where we try to give outrageous and contagious generosity. We have an outreach team that literally just goes out and just knocks on a door to pray with an individual to just bring a little Jesus into the neighborhood. And I'm not trying to make this sound like an infomercial, but when we make that the solution, sometimes a lot of us don't know how to engage all those things because of all the things of life. And I would argue as important and as imperative as every single one of those ministries, and let me repeat, every single one of those ministries is at the direction of following the instruction of Christ. I would say the deepest impact, the deepest impact that you can have as a follower of Christ is your impact that you have within your home. The impact that you have within your household. In the New Testament, there's this uh, word that you can throw up in Greek, and this is this idea of an oikos, which is a, a word for household and family. It's found throughout the New Testament. We're going to talk about some stories today. But really what this is, is 8 to 15 people with whom you share mo life most closely. It's the people who see you the most. It's the place where you have a sphere of significant 
influence. It's those 8 to 15 people that you live with, that are your neighbors, the person that you run into at the grocery store on a regular basis. It's the people that you have that influence with. It's the people that God has ordained to be a part of your life to do something amazing in their life. As you look through the New Testament, if you see the gospel spreading and beginning to move, 95% of people coming to know faith in the story of God is through the influence of somebody in their oikos. Somebody inviting Jesus into their household. Somebody in spreading, having their life changed and sharing it with their family. Sharing it with those they love, those that they have influence with. So today we want to go through a couple stories. And for us, I, I kind of want to claim them as like family stories. I'm not sure if you have family vacation stories but, or uh, just things that mark your family. I, I've had several of those on the side of the road when you're in an RV and you're stuck and all my families joke about it, right? Or maybe a vacation that went really well or a marking moment where something shifted in your family for positive or negative. These are some of those moments that I want to go to today. And so the first one that we're going to talk through is actually the story of Matthew, also known as Levi. It's going to be recorded by the Apostle Mark. And so in Mark 2, we see an interaction with Jesus. And this is how it begins. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector booth. So this guy, Levi, or Matthew, is a tax collector. Not a super popular guy in ancient Israel. He's somebody that's outside of who a prophet or who a person of God would be talking to. And he comes along and he says, Jesus says, follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's home, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him, and his followers were there. There were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, told him, uh, saw him eating with the, the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but to the sinners. So often, we as followers of Christ experience something and it changes our life. And we want to walk away from those that we're once in our oikos, in our family, in our household. And hear me, there's some dysfunctional things, there's some hurtful things that we need to walk away from. So I embrace some nuance. Hear me when I say this. But sometimes the people who we have walked and experienced Christ and transformed are the exact same people who need to see a witness of a transformed life because you were there. You experienced the hurt, the brokenness, the pain, the perspectives that got them to that point. And you can show the gospel in the midst of that. So that's an opportunity that we see Jesus through Matthew as somebody who went and was with them because they all looked like Matthew and Jesus embraced them. And we are called to do the exact same. And it's kind of cool at this moment we see a pretty cool truth. That there is a, there's a sacred thing that happens in the Gospels and in, in our lives as well. And it's the sacred place of the table. So how do you define who is in that 8 to 15 people? It's simply who are you eating with? Who are you going out with? Who are you having coffee with? When you are at work, who are you eating at the same table with? you'll be surprised at the amount of influence that you can have 
as you bring and claim that, that opportunity to be there. So that's the first. The fact that in Matthew had people that looked exactly like him. The second is a few chapter or pages over in Mark 5. Where Jesus, the, the bold, the bold uh, story headline is Jesus restores a demon-possessed man. And so Jesus comes along and he uh, interacts with this man who is not only possessed, but he is possessed by what is called a, a legion or a thousand demons. And this is just a very controlled individual that is dealing with the consequences of what he has opened himself up to spiritually. And he has lost control of his life. And he is in utter chaos. And he is constantly being in jail. He's constantly being tied up and constrained. And he has such power because of the oppression that he breaks out. And so he, Jesus comes upon this man who everyone once again would say is hopeless. Everyone would say is beyond hope. And we see Jesus interact with this person. And, and Jesus demands that the, the, the demons go away and they go out and they actually take over some pigs and there's some drama that's some pretty interesting story. Um, but what comes to this moment is a man who's experienced an incredible freedom. And he comes to his Savior and something super weird happens. Jesus sends him back. This man who has been redeemed and restored from so much, and time and time again, Jesus is constantly saying, follow me, follow me, right? And yet this time, he says, go back. In verse uh, 19, I believe. And it says right there, And Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell uh, in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. This is a moment where what God has done became a change agent in the communities that he returned to. But the truth for us as fathers of Christ, as we see this transformational moment, some of us may say, as you look back on your past, man, I was too messed up. I can't look at the people that I interacted with when I was in the midst of that life because I'm going to be judged for where I've been. And we limit God's ability to use our lives as a testimony because we allow the enemy to control our past. Does that make sense? Where the enemy controls who we were instead of allowing God to be the winner of who we are today. So we, as followers of Christ, we have this opportunity to walk back into any situation celebrating what God has done. Because no matter where we came from, it's a testimony of celebration. So if your family... Your oikos, your place of influence, has seen you at your worst. Don't allow the enemy to corrupt that or pervert that to prevent you from being a light and a hope in that situation. Because I can almost see it being easier for this demon-possessed man to follow Jesus than to go back to the people who literally just saw him insane out of his mind, out of his control. And yet Jesus instructs him to do so. And I think he calls us to do as well. Another story that can kind of change, and and as you see your own perspective, maybe your family is one of those families that you know where everybody stands spiritually, and it's just a cold place. And the only thing that's going to change things is a miracle. Only thing is going to change is something miraculous happens. That's what happens in this story in John 4. And so John 4, we see once again Jesus just going about his life, going about for us, that's like just going to Publix, getting our sweet tea, because it's just a blessing from heaven. I don't know what they do, but it's just so good. 
But we see in the midst of this ordinary life, this man comes, this royal official. Once again, someone that might not, that's in another category of people than Jesus. It's amazing how often Jesus breaks down barriers. Man, it would have been cool to watch him just blow through all the barriers that existed. Anyways, but we see this royal official come to him. And he says in uh, verse 49, Sir, come down. Or actually, he, he talks about uh, his, uh, his, uh, his child being sick. And so he makes this uh, statement. Sir, come down before my child dies. He's begging for this teacher, this prophet, to heal his child. And Jesus says, go, Jesus replied, your son will live. I don't, once again, I might be the horrible person in the room, but if my child is sick and dying, I want the guy there to make it happen, Right? I want to see my kid get better. And yet we see this royal official. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And so he and his whole household believed. His whole oikos, those that he had influence on, believed because of a miracle. Y'all, we serve a God of miracles. Things that are unexplainable can be pursued because of who we serve. And in some situations, a miracle is the only thing that is going to change. And now hear me, the goal is never to desire something bad on anyone. But the brokenness of this world is significant enough, it will impact everyone. And yet the moment when Jesus can change it all, can change your family, can change your oikos. But the thing that I want to encourage you, if your family, if you maybe even your own heart is in that space of, man, I just need to see a miracle. It's amazing how small that miracle can be. For Jesus, it was breaking a fever at just the right time. For us, it could be a miraculous moment where somebody, a child is sick in the NICU and unexplainably things get better. Hearts that were once defective now function. Who knows? But what the the lesson is, no matter your situation, let me encourage you to keep hoping, keep praying, keep leaning in to the miraculous that can change it all. The next story or transition moment that I want to talk through is uh, in Acts 10. It's this story of Cornelius. And this is a wonderful story of Peter. Um, and really, the, the, I'm going to summarize for, uh, for time. But really, Peter is a disciple. Cornelius is a centurion ruler. Once again, outside of people you should be interacting with. Actually, a Gentile. So against the law, the religious law to interact with. And so we see Jesus, who is the one who is called, constantly breaking barriers, calling Peter, his disciple, to break a barrier. And so we see through two visions, one to Paul and one to Cornelius, where they are instructed to find each other. And Cornelius immediately falls, uh, sends some people after him. Uh, Peter responds. I encourage you to read the whole story because it's amazing. But what happens is when they come together, Cornelius had some expectations. In uh, chapter 10 of Acts, verse 24, we see Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. He brought together his oikos, his household, the people that he had influence over. And Peter goes about explaining the gospel in such a way that it's it, it breaks down all of our barriers because as he was explaining the gospel, the Holy Spirit's power fell. They begin to speak in tongues. They see miraculous. And so it breaks this whole barrier of what does it mean to be followers of Christ? And the Holy Spirit does something unique in them and through them. Now, 
I would love for that to happen in my family. But the truth is, it all began with obedience in listening. Both Peter and Cornelius had a word from the Lord. They had a vision. And they chose to obey. And we will find when we are listening and when we are prepared, if you are a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're a neighbor, if you're a coworker, it's really cool when you're listening, the Holy Spirit cracks that He creates in conversations, in opportunities. But the truth for us, if we're truly going to impact to the, de- the depth to see a transformation happen, we must listen and obey and be prepared for what God has for us. Now, there's a couple practical things that I want to encourage us towards today. The first being, and I didn't even put this on the handout, so I apologize, is simply this, a genuine, passionate relationship with Jesus. If you want to see a deep impact in those that are closest to you, a relationship with Christ that is life-giving and fresh is so attractive. It is so intriguing. It is undefinable and can change your family by just being a genuine follower of Christ. But practically, because I'm a practical person, the first is do not be intimidated by your past. So often no one knows you like your relatives. So no one knows you like those that you have had fits of anger towards, that you've been unkind to, that you have hurt. And yet, forgiveness is contagious. When we pursue forgiveness and receive forgiveness, it's amazing what God, has, God can do. Secondly, do not take God's responsibility on your shoulders. In every single one of these stories, all we see is a obedience and allow God to work in a situation. It is never, we are never the Messiah. We are never the Superman who's supposed to solve everything. We are just called to be faithful and loving and obedient. Ultimately, it's all on God. And I hope that's a freeing reality for you. I hope that's a freeing truth that it's all on Him. Next is that we need to recognize our actions reinforce our words. When we interact, let's be, let's be real. There's a little bit of, uh, in all of us that we are imperfect. There's going to be some level of hypocrisy in all of our life. That's why we need conviction of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) We need to grow. We need to change. And so to to try to act like we are perfect, not necessarily the best idea. But when we actually recognize that when our words match our actions, when our love and grace match actions of love and grace, God can do amazing transformative things if that be with your kids, if that be with your grandparents, or someone you just run into at Publix. God can do amazing things when those things align. Once again, just a practical thing, consider writing a letter. Have you guys ever had moments where words got in the way? There's a book, uh, oh man, I forget what it's talked about. Anyways, it talks about management and how we behave the worst when things matter the most. Sometimes just writing a letter, asking for forgiveness, giving forgiveness, just expressing what Jesus has done in your life can be an incredibly restorative thing. Realize you're not alone. Ask God to send other witnesses to people you love and care about. Continue to hope and risk in prayer. Someone that you know is making hard decisions that are stuck in selfishness and sin. And when you're not in those environments, you realize sin will always take you further and cost you more than you ever ask or imagine. And yet, God can change it all. So continue to pray and ask for those additional witnesses, people to come alongside, for God to just miraculously change that situation. And remember in hope that God can do anything. We as followers of Christ, as I've said probably five times in this last 20 or so minutes, is that we are people of hope. We are bringers of hope into this situation. And so, do you need the Holy Spirit to change your vision? 
Do you need to see these stories? And if you read through the Gospels, you'll see more and more and more this reality of God using those that we influence most to change a family, to change a city, to change a nation, to change a world through Christ. One simple application. I know I've given you six different things to do. Don't try to do them all. Try to do one or something. But one that you could do, and it fits with Josh's wonderful announcement earlier about Alpha. Maybe you know someone that has got some significant questions. And they will never go to something like that themselves. But if you go with them, maybe they have an opportunity. And I can guarantee there will be some great snacks that the youth group will be crazy jealous about. And I don't think many of them are in here, so I'll be honest about it. But just an opportunity over a few weeks to build relationships and have honest conversations. Because guess what? The gospel of Jesus Christ can hold up to questions. It can hold up in the competition of ideas in the world. And this is a space to help make that happen. So check out this video uh, summarizing what that looks like a little bit for us.